it seems like you have, over the course of your research career, been in so many diverse disciplines and really have been an integrator. How did that um, love of unifying topics come to be in the, in the early days of your career? Before I decided I was going to become a physician and become a neurologist and neuroscientist, which is something I always uh, wanted to be in some way, I, I thought very seriously about uh, philosophy as a career and uh, was actually a philosophy professor of mine that after listening with great patience to what I wanted to do and what I was interested in, it said, no, what you really want to be is a brain scientist, which was a rather interesting revelation for a 15-year-old. Um, and so th that's the best I can, I can answer your, your, your question. There, there was something about searching for things and finding solutions to, to uh, problems, but at the same time trying to put the machine back together. That's a great answer. I mean, just the fact that you had those three different disciplines that rarely even two of them come together, the clinical yeah. practice, the research, and the philosophy. Yeah. I actually did neuroscience in laboratories prior to even doing my clinical training in neurology. But it was, um, I, I'm very, several times I thought I wouldn't do the clinical training. Uh, and I had, uh, the idea that it was going to be a waste of time and that was not quite what I wanted. And I'm very grateful that I did because it gave me an insight in, into humanity and actually into brain and mind functions that I would not have otherwise. And I very often find in people who were trained uh, through straightforward scientific career and did not have the exposure to human beings with diseases that uh, break down their minds and that create a, a whole slew of problems and manifestations that are not commonly seen in in day-to-day -day life. I find them. I find that they do not have. They're lacking an experience that is absolutely unique. So I'm glad I I was for a time a neurologist. Yes. Uh, it's a very interesting to, to also live in that uh, the problem space and not just the yeah. solution space. Yeah. Um, in a way, I also see the the flavor of your work as being very linked into those early days of research at MIT, where you were around the heretics who were at the time trying to debunk the the determinism of Skinner mm -hmm. and come up with a more uh, humanistic, integrated view of of mind. Absolutely, yeah, and I had a very good fortune of knowing some of the people who were giants of that uh, of that era and also a man who was the closest to the main mentor of my life is a man by the name of Norman Gashrind who was a neuroscientist neurologist and was professor of neurology at Harvard and uh, who's definitely the most important influence in my in my uh, life as a scientist. In terms of that life as a scientist, you talk to us today about what consciousness is. Um, how has your view of what consciousness is changed over the last 30 years? Oh, I guess that probably my earliest view of consciousness was very, very much tied to clinical observations and to conditions such as, for example, coma. Uh, where you have a, a direct manifestation of a loss of consciousness. Um, and now that that is sort of very, very far in the background. And, um, and my view has been shaped by things around consciousness. I've had an interest in consciousness, but it's actually uh, um, my knowledge of what certain cognitive systems are capable of doing and my knowledge of what feeling systems do and i'm really talking specifically about feeling and not about emotion so that we refer directly to mental experiences and not to action programs emotions uh, like motivations for example uh, or drives are action programs 
and it doesn't make any difference whether you have an experience to go with them or not. Whereas feelings are of necessity mental experiences of some state that is occurring in your living organism, in your body. And, um, and so the knowledge about those systems of experience uh, they have really shaped what I think about consciousness to the point of actually seeing the two um, tied at the hip. <laughs> does, it, does that mean, uh, to use, to paraphrase another thing you said, that feelings are the referrer, the self, the thing that's being referred to, the self, and, and emotions are, uh, are more the thing that the self is, is participating in? Yeah, to some extent. I would put it in different, slightly different terms. So the feelings are always on the side of expressing something that is happening in the organism, in reality, and that has to do with actions. Emotions are those actions when they have to do with very complicated programs such as the program of fear or, or anger or, or what have you, benevolence and uh, compassion. Um, so emotions are like drives and motivations about action programs, sequences of things. It's like, I like to call them mini concerts. Music is a good analogy for that. Uh, whereas the feelings are about experiencing the result of those concerts with all the players doing the right thing in time. Related to that and the effect that emotions have on us, what's something, that's another piece of work that you're very famous for. What's something that you saw a lot of people getting wrong about the way in which emotions influence human decisions? Yeah, I think that it's, it's quite true that until reasonably recently, people saw decisions as the result of a reasoning program, a pure reasoning program. Uh, and in fact, they tended to think of emotions and feelings as something to stay away from and to avoid because they were going to compromise uh, the, the process of decision making. You wanted to make it pure. Uh, and this is uh, clearly flies in the face of reality. And uh, we have very good evidence, and that actually comes from human pathology, that people who lose emotion and the ability to emote and feel across a large range of emotions, but at the same time maintain the uh, clarity in terms of their reasoning actually are worse deciders than those who may be even less smart, but have emotions that can help them guide the process of deciding. So it's clear that at least some emotions are quite beneficial for the process of, of decision. Is it possible that one way to get a balance between uh, good emotions and, and bad emotions is to accept more uh, vulnerability and um, and strive less for perfectionism? The vulnerability and the, the, the weakness that is tied to vulnerability is part of a biological system. It's part of the, the vagaries of what we have to deal with. And it would be very strange if those vagaries would not have played a role in building our intelligence, our kind of intelligence. It is perfectly obvious that artificial intelligence systems have not been built according to those rules. They have been built on the opposite goal. The, opposite, the, the goal is make it perfect, make the algorithm deliver mm -hmm. what it has on the right time. 